Well, thank you, um, Mark. I'd like to thank um, LC North America for inviting me as a scientific advisor and giving me the opportunity to discuss some of my research today. And it's um, quite interesting that Teresa and I both do work in pediatric nutrition, so I think it's hopefully showing the importance of babies. So my disclosures, the work I'm gonna talk about was funded in part by me, Johnson Nutrition and Dairy Research, and I've received grant funding and served as a consultant um, and advisory boards. So I know I only have a short period of time, so I'm going to take you very quickly through some work we've been doing for about the last um, eight to 10 years in my lab, um, primarily in collaboration with Rob Chapkin at Texas A&M. And if we run short on time, I, I won't talk as much about the future directions. But as most of us know, the intestinal tract of the newborn undergoes a marked structural and functional adaptation in response to feeding. And I, and I love this. We do not have a nutrition facts label for breast milk. And we, we probably never will because we continue to identify, you know, with advancing technology, for example, the human milk oligosaccharides, which we knew very little about a decade ago. We now know there's 200 forms and they're impacted by genetics and they play important roles in the infant. So, you know, the goal ultimately is to have all infants have the best nutrition and breastfeeding is best, but in the U.S. about 80% of infants get infant formula at some point in their life. So there's a lot of interest in trying to identify these bioactive components and, and study their function. Um, much of the work that comes in this area is work from animal models. So Teresa and I both work with piglet models because one of the reasons why we wanted to develop non-invasive methods is because we just don't know much about what's going on in the infant intestine because it's unethical to do biopsies or invasive methods. So most of the data that we have is from infants, from sudden infant death who, who have, or have died from other reasons. And you can imagine that's not a great um, data evidence base. So my work, um, since my doctoral work has been focused on human milk, we know it's chock full of goodies. Um, it has components that um, stimulate intestinal development, but we also know that it stimulates, the, um, shapes the intestinal microbiota. And again, work from germ-free animals show that an intestinal microbiota is absolutely essential for normal development of the infant, not only in terms of the gut, but the immune system, and more recently, even cognitive development. And some very interesting work shows there's there's a developmental window for cognitive development that if a rat pup or mouse pup is germ-free, they develop abnormal behaviors. And if you colonize them, even with an adult microbiota before weaning, you can correct those um, behavioral abnormalities. If you try to do it later in life, they're irreversible. So, you know, one of the things we think about, we evolved surrounded by microbes. You know, they've been around a lot longer than we have. We've taken them into our bodies and it's, makes sense that they would play a role in shaping not only our nutrition, but also our development. So when we look at um, establishment of the microbiota, the infancy is critically important. It's also important to note the human microbiome project did not study infants or the elderly. They were all between 20 and 45 years of age. So our biggest initiative to date did not study infants at all. So that, they were added after words, but a lot of the sample sizes are quite small, so I would encourage, you know, infants to be a, um, a key factor. So, you know, how infants are born, um, if they're preterm versus term, and a lot of this preterm is how we treat preterm infants. Many are C-section, many receive just standard operating procedures, um, antibiotics, and they may have delayed um, feeding. So rooted delivery, perineal antibiotics, once they come home, siblings, pets in the home, smoking, daycare, et cetera. My interest has been primarily in the area of nutrition. We've had NIH funding looking at human milk oligosaccharides. We now know that there's bacteria in milk um, by sequencing you know, many different genera. They seem to be unique by mother. They don't change much during lactation. So when an infant is breastfeeding, they're not only getting prebiotics, these HMOs and even proteins, but they're getting probiotics, they're getting live microbes that aren't present in infant formula. Um, in infant formula, we have attempted to add pre and probiotics to recapitulate some of the benefit of human milk, but they're usually just one or two, and there's over 200 
HMOs and we had one or two prebiotics. So we're certainly not mimicking the benefit. So um, this, I'm gonna go through this. This is basically what's been driving my research for the last couple of years. And I call it getting a look into the black box. So as I indicated, you know, I, a lot of our work was good stuff comes, goes in and poop comes out and we don't know much about what, what's going on in the middle. So we've been asking the question about the intestinal microbiome, which again is pretty easy to get to these days with a fecal sample. You can do 16S to look at who's there. You can do metagenomics or metatranscriptomics to look at function. This has been a little bit more trickier in human subjects looking at what's going on on the host side. We know that metabolomics is important. A lot of the interactions between the microbes and the host are direct interactions through things like TLR receptors, and, but also it's the metabolites, the short-chain fatty acids and the other nutrients. And, and how this works out is, a, is the balance between health and disease. So we've been um, focusing a lot on um, breastfed versus formula-fed infants. So what I'm gonna do today is kind of quickly take you through some of our work in this area. So as I mentioned, we've had this challenge of how do we query what's going on in the infant gut. And so, you know, my colleague Rob Chapkin at Texas A&M, who I went to graduate school at UC Davis, he had developed a method of using exfoliated epithelial cells to, um, to look at the transcriptome. And he had developed, this is interest is in colon cancer, and he had shown in adult humans as well as in rodents that you can collect these exfoliated cells, do um, microRNAs, or now we're doing sequencing and to see differences either with diet or disease. And so when I was on sabbatical a couple years ago, I said, well, Rob, do you think we can, this will work in babies because this would really be a way to, to, to query the system. So, I started very simply with breastfed versus formula-fed infants, and we hypothesized that we would indeed be able to get mRNA signatures from exfoliated cells, which would inform what's going on in the gut. Um, all this work says, has been published, so if you're interested, you can um, look at it in more detail. So this was started um, just breastfed, formula-fed infants. This is obviously a breastfed baby stool sample, and the beauty of this, this was done in the mother's home, in her bathroom. So, you know, we were able to send home the kits, the moms would collect the stool, they would call us and we could come pick it up. So we don't have to worry about, you know, very few people will poop on command. So it's a, it's a technique I think that's actually for the food industry is very um, beneficial because, as I'll show you, one of the benefits is you can do a a stool sample and a subject before you start a dietary treatment, and then you can start your dietary treatment. You can collect a stool sample every single day, then you can stop your treatment and collect stool samples. And we've talked a little bit about personalized medicine. You know, being able to look at how individuals are responding to diet, I think, is a very powerful method. So this was an early study, so we did gene microarrays. Um, since then, the next question we wanted to get at is to look at this host-microbe interaction. So we um, did both 16S and metagenomic sequencing. This was published in Genome Biology, and I was I'm not big for beating my own drum, but this paper has been accessed about 35,000 times, and so I think it's probably going to be one of the most impactful papers in, in my career. We've also, I don't have time to talk about it, but we've been looking at how the um, human milk oligosaccharides are um, predicting the microbiome. So um, for the, this is our, our st initial study, and, and really to remember this is a proof of concept, so our, our sample sizes weren't large. We also wanted to be very narrow. We knew that, for example, rooted delivery impacted um, microbiome, so we they were all vaginally delivered, second parity, exclusively breast or formula fed. This was supported by Mead Johnson, so all the babies got the same formula um, in a number of exclusion criteria. There were no differences in the subjects. Um, we assessed infant growth and, and formula intake by 24-hour weighing, and there was no difference between the groups. So um, basically, just as the technique is um, sampling um, into a um, trizol reagent. We use a different reagent now, but basically a reagent that um, 
inhibits the RNases and DNases, so it helps to decrease any mRNA degradation. And then we also froze samples for um, short-chain fatty acids and, and microbiota. But this was actually, you know, the mom in the home doing this, so it's a, it's a nice technique. Um, in early studies, we would get questions, are you sure you're really getting host mRNA? Is this, you know, contaminated? So this was a study that Rob had done. He has a patent for the method. And these were adult subjects that were going in for routine um, screening colonoscopy. So what he had them do was collect stool samples prior to the bowel cleanse. And then during the um, colonoscopy, they also got tissue biopsies. And at this point, this is just a slop blot hybridization. So um, basically, mammalian mRNA has a poly A tail, and bacteria doesn't. So I was looking at just hy um, hybridization to a biotinylated oligo-DT. So with colon mRNA, these are just different amounts. You see hybridization. With the fecal poly A, we see hybridization, but not with either bacterial DNA or RNA. So in our first paper, I'd have to say we were very conservative. So at this time, we were using microarrays. There are about 57,000 genes. And the first step in being conservative is we only queried genes that showed up on all the arrays. So we had to see it in both breastfed and formula fed. So we kind of potentially were missing genes that were only on the breastfed or the formula fed. Once we did all our corrections for false discovery, we had about 1,214 genes that were significantly differentially expressed between breastfed and formula fed. Again, as a step of being conservative, prior to doing the research um, through an extensive literature review, we came up with about 530 genes that we a priori had hypothesized would be different. So then we just queried these 1,200 genes on our 529 and came up with 146. So that first paper, we were really just looking at 146 genes. Um, subsequently, we've gone back to, to do more work. And we did a, a number of different techniques, and I'm only going to present two, but I think the important thing that Dr. Lynch was talking about is these collaborations were done with engineers and with bioinformatics experts and people who had developed you know, non-biased computer programs for querying like large data sets, even you know, back in 2008 when we were doing this. So one of it is called the linear discriminant analysis, and I'll show you what that looks like. And it allows you to, to say what genes or combinations are best classifiers. There's also um, coefficient of determination, which kind of can help you see which genes are driving expression of other genes. And then we also used a commercial metacore. Um, it's a commercial program where you, you have these genes, you put them in there, and it puts it into networks and um, puts it into physiological context for you. So this is the idea of a linear discriminant analysis. And what you're trying to do is have the computer tell you what genes or combinations of genes allows you to characterize your two groups. So in our case, it was formula-fed or breastfed, but this could be no fiber, high fiber, colon cancer, no colon cancer. So um, these are just two genes, uncoupling protein 2, EPAS, um, forkhead um, box protein, synaptophysin, which is of interest because it's I'm thought to be involved in gut-brain axis and one of the ways the microbiome may be communicating with the brain. And this EPAS1 is one that actually came out to be our most um, definitive gene. And it's the nice thing about microarrays, it was something that we would have never hypothesized. It's a gene that helps the gut tolerate hypoxic episodes, which we think is very important for preterm infants and are, are following up on that. But what I, when I look at these is these are um, biomarkers. And so in the future, we have a number of these genes that we could say, okay, what happens if we come and add formula, um, an ingredient to formula X? Where do those babies, you know, do they move to be more like breastfed or do they move to be intermediate? So again, to give you an idea of some of the, the genes, this um, EPAS1, all of the genes that were best for discriminating breastfed and formula-fed infants were all overexpressed. They were expressed at a higher level in breastfed. And we've now seen this across humans, piglets, and, and rhesus macaques, that the net effect of formula feeding is actually to downregulate gene expression in the gut, which in and of itself is an interesting observation. Um, 
Some of these are important for tight junctions. We know that breastfed or formula fed babies have leakier guts. We have um, genes in, involved in the immune system transcription, and again, our, our EPAS1. So when we put this into um, the micro, into the, these genes into Metacore, this tells you what kinds of pathways that they're involved in. And let me tell you, I've been a strong advocate for breastfeeding for 30 years, but I would have never hypothesized that the, the strongest genes were fundamental genes in gut development. So Wnt is a fundamental gene that controls proliferation in the gut, and it's actually dysregulated during cancer. Notch is a gene that tells those epithelial cells what to differentiate into. TGF-beta is very important for tolerance in the gut, so potentially a role in allergy. But we also see cell migration, barrier function, inflammation. So really for the first time in a completely non-invasive way, we were able to assign genes to potential clinical and epidemiological observations that have been made for, for many years regarding um, breastfed versus formula-fed infants. So um, again, for this first part, we were able to see relationships between diet and host gene expression, provides potential insights into mechanisms, whereas human milk um, regulates intestinal development. And I don't have time to show, but we've also done a recent study with preterm infants with Cami Martin at Harvard and showed that we can use this technique to see differences in developmentally regulated genes as well. So the, the last part is um, then looking at host microbe interactions. And so kind of looking at um, kind of the host side. So we, when we just did pyro sequencing of the, the um, fecal um, samples, this is what's called a principal coordinates analysis and shows very nicely that the breastfed infants um, sep are separate from the formula fed infants. So this is telling you that the microbiota in these two populations is different. And that's not earth shattering. Most people um, knows, knew that. I just, didn't point it out earlier, but I wanted to just make a point, is the formula feds, in this case, are tend to be much more, cluster much more closely together than our breast feds. And we see the same thing with the gene expression, that, again, this formula was really pushing all these formula fed infants, their microbiota and their gene expression to be much more similar, whereas we see a lot of variation, much more variation with breast fed infants. So when we looked at what, um, phyla of bacteria were driving the differences. It was basically the firmicutes and the Bacteroidetes. This as adults, about 90% of our bacteria would fall into these two phyla. And infants, both formula fed and breast fed had about a little over 50% actinobacteria, and this is where bifidobacteria is. And when you go down, this is almost all bifidobacteria, but the types of bifidobacteria they have are different. So in the breast fed, it's almost all Bifidobacterium infantis, and the formulas have none of that. So even though you might say, oh, well, they have the same amount of actinobacteria, the same amount of bifidobacteria, but you really have to, to drill down a bit more. Um, an interesting fact is in our study, you can see that, um, that basically very little um, Bacteroidetes at all in the formula fed. And work from Jeff Gordon's lab has shown that this firmicutes to Bacteroidetes ratio is important for obesity. And this, my friends, is a very obesogenic um, microbiota in these infants. And other studies have not shown this, but others have. Um, I think it might depend on the type of formula. But again, this idea of are we seeding these little babies, they're only three months old, with potentially a more obesogenic um, microbiota. So I showed you kind of the, the big picture, but then as we started drilling down what we found, and again, this is an example, these blue guys are all our formula guys. So these are our phyla, the percentage of um, firmicutes, actinobacteria. So you can see how consistent they are. Our breast feds, there was a lot that followed the same pattern, but we had a couple that had an individual, more of a unique pattern. So we then asked, can we use some of these differences individual differences to predict potentially the host gene expression. So um, I know from the back you're not going to be able to see this, but 
we then looked at seed categories and while um, we saw some differences, so this gives you the proportion of genes um, in the bacteria, so these are carbohydrates, that we see that there are a larger proportion of carbohydrate metabolism and formula fed versus a larger proportion of genes involved in protein metabolism in the breastfed. These are not significant, but we've seen at a metabolomics level, this is resulting in different metabolites, so we still <coughs> think it's interesting to look at. The one category that actually was different was virulence, and so that's when we wanted to look at the host versus the microbe gene expression. We focused on genes that were in this virulence category. So we had the, the host gene expression from the Chapkin 2010 paper, and so for this paper we did um, shotgun DNA sequencing, so basically metabolomics or metagenomics. Then from that, we focused on the virulence gene. So this is where, again, where we used our bioinformatics experts. And to your point, there's a great training grant at Texas A&M that's teaching bioinformatics. But we keep pulling them into these nutrition and cancer and health problems. Um, so I think it's a great cross-training. So we, we basically, the way they did, it's called um, repeated canonical correlation analysis. So there's like, you take three bacterial genes, three host genes, and you just keep querying them against each other to look at where the relationships are. And so when we looked at virulence genes versus random genes, no, no relationship. Intestinal biology genes, there was a relationship, but all of those genes actually were in this category, which is immunity and defense genes. So we found by this canonical correlation analysis, a relationship between the virulence genes in the microbiota and the immunity and defense genes in the baby's exfoliated cells. So this was really, again, the first evidence that the microbiota may actually be interacting with the, the baby's epithelial cells to influence the expression of immunity and defense genes. So when we looked at just, and you can look at the paper for all the genes, but these are the 11 genes that were most related to microbial virulence genes. And the, the green ones are upregulated and the orange ones are downregulated. Um, so you can see genes um, like a lipoxygenase gene, um, binding proteins, or this is a LPS binding protein, um, also a selectin IL-1. So these were all downregulated in the breastfed. So even though these were related to virulence genes, the net effect of breastfeeding is actually to downregulate the expression of these genes. And so again, this is exactly what we would have we hypothesize from what we see with inflammation in breastfed versus formula fed infants. So this is a relationship between host genes, microbial genes, that's being regulated through nutrition. And I know I'm going through this fast, but I had a very short period of time. I'm happy to talk to anyone later. So again, we're seeing this multivariate structure related to the host immune system microbiome virulence characteristics. Um, I didn't point out, but one of the things that kind of surprised us, there was actually, there were more virulence genes in breastfeds. And we're like, oh, well, that's not what we expected. But we knew the babies weren't sick. They hadn't been on antibiotics. And what we think is this is because the breastfed babies, I showed you the difference between the Bactrodides and the Firmicutes. So the breastfed babies have a larger complement of these gram-negative bacteria, and these are where the microbiologists, these bacteria have these genes that are called virulence, but in talking to people like David Mills, who's a microbiologist, that we don't think this is actually triggering um, actual inflammation, but it might actually be playing a role in this education. So it's sort of tickling the immune system without actually causing um, a true infection. How am I doing? Okay, so I'll just kind of quickly take you through our, kind of our last um, just to show where we're going with this, because again, all the data that I've showed you so far is based on relatively small numbers of infants, but we feel that the techniques are established and um, are well in hand. And so we have a, a longitudinal cohort that's um, currently um, going on in the Champaign-Urbana area. It's called Strong Kids 2, it's supported by the Dairy Research Institute, so a nice public-private partnership. We're going to be following kids for birth to five years of age, and um, we're almost to our 440. 
and, and so a lot of what we're, my interest again is looking at early growth, also dairy research interest in childhood obesity, exclusive breastfeeding, epidemiological studies show it's modestly predictive against excessive growth, but um, exclusive formula feeding does increase obesity risk. Um, I talked to some people yesterday, is this idea of combined feeding, because what we see in the U.S. is that a lot of infants are getting a combination of breast milk and infant formula once moms go back to work, and sometimes even from birth, but there's really a dearth of of scientific evidence on, in these infants. And oftentimes they're clumped together with, with breastfeds because they've, they're receiving some breast milk. And I think that really clouds the epidemiological data and the benefits of breastfeeding. So we have a, a very um, robust survey that changes over time. These are the times that we're collecting. We're also, um, I think what's unique about our study is we have the questionnaire data but it, we also have biometric measures, so we're doing heightened weights at all time points from um, the mother and the child. We're getting stool samples, we're getting saliva samples to do DNA and, and breast milk samples. And um, so just to show you, this is 295 of our cohort that have passed a year. So what really surprised me about our cohort, if you look at the CDC data, we would expect exclusive breastfeeding in a year to be down around 16 to 18 percent, but we actually have about 40 percent of our cohort still exclusively breastfeeding. So it's not nationally representative, but I think it's going to actually give us a large enough data set to ask some of these questions about breastfeeding. Um, and a little preliminary data. So this is just shows the ages and the different bars and um, the percent of infants that are um, at risk. So these are the infants that have a BMI greater than 85th percentile in the breastfed. So you can see as they get to nine and 12 months, more of our infants are moving into these categories. The combined feds seem to be somewhat intermediate, but what's really surprising us is this group is um, in the exclusively formula fed. Some, what's going on between six, um, even three months and six months is that many more of these infants are moving into um, the at risk of overweight. And we think this is a lot about how um, complementary foods are being added at this age group. So it's something we're, we're interested in. So just to thank again Rob Chapkin, who's a great friend and an even better collaborator, <laughs> which is hard to have both of those and, and some of the people I've worked with and our, our support. And, I always like to end with, with this slide because I, I do think breastfeeding is a balance of art and science. Hi, Allison Yates. That's very interesting. How, uh, you mentioned at the end about uh, complementary feeding. How are you handling that as an additional uh, variable? Well, this is a longitudinal cohort, so we're, not, we're only following them. We're not intervening, but we have very extensive um, surveys on introduction of solids. We're using some of the CDC validated surveys. And, and now that we're seeing this, we're actually planning to go back and do some focus groups to, to get a little bit more um, information around that time point. And, and in your initial study where you were uh, talking, I think there were three-month-old uh, breastfed and, and formula-fed, were they not on any complementary food at that point? Right. Yeah, they're, they're following the guidelines to not introduce prior to four. So right now it's really iffy in the U.S. Women will introduce between four to six months. So, but they're not, if we chose that three month because they were still being exclusively breastfed or formula fed. Sharon, that was a great talk. Thank you. Uh, Michael McBurney, DSM Nutritional Products. When you're looking at your breastfed versus uh, formula fed, you're, you're looking at relative differences. Are those expressed on concentration or on sto total stool output, or what's, what's the denominator for that comparison? For gene expression? Yeah. Or, well, so, basically, it's just mRNA expression, so it's not... So it's from, a, it's from a spot sample that within that one gram sample, this is the relative concentration. Right. Right. Even though, uh, and so one of the interesting questions could be if the output is very different between between mm -hmm. those groups that yeah. could change the direction. Well, and that, I mean, it's a great question. And I mean, one of the beauties of this technique is that you could collect a sample from every diaper. Yep. Um, 
And we've done that a little bit with microbiome sampling, and um, what we find is that there's, the benefit is to get more subjects instead of more frequent sampling from subjects because there's, um, there wasn't as much difference. You know, we tried sampling, these were adults, you know, very yeah. frequently and wasted a lot of money on sequencing when we said we should have had more subjects. I'm just thinking so. about the short-chain fatty acid story yeah. decades ago that showed differences in terms of total output versus concentration in the stool. Yeah, I mean, the beauty again of infants is that they, um, they're fed almost every couple hours. And so, you know, it's not like adult humans where you might see more fluctuations. But these are all great questions.